All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. You, a behavior analyst, are happy with the topography of your client's behavior, but you now want to shape within the topography of the behavior. What is the most critical aspect of the behavior that you are going to target with your intervention? So let's think about this one. Don't rush through the questions, right? Let's consider the questions first before we get to the answer choices. So we're thinking about the most critical aspects of the behavior and what intervention are we trying to use? Well, we want to shape within the topography. So when we shape, we can shape across topographies or we can shape within. When you shape across, that's what we typically think of with shaping. We have approximations of behavior where the responses are getting closer and closer to our terminal behavior and we're reinforcing those approximations. When you shape within topography, you've more or less reached the terminal behavior, but now you want to change an aspect of the topography. So the example I like to give is, let's say you are playing a song on the piano. Let's say you can play the, the song perfectly and hit all of the notes correctly. But now we want to speed it up. We want you to play faster. We don't want to change the topography because we want you to play the right notes. We need to change another aspect, though. And what aspect is that? A, the topography. So careful. We're not changing necessarily the topography. We don't want to change how it looks. You're playing all the right notes. The topography looks good. What we want to change is, in this example, the speed. So what we need to change is B, the magnitude. And when you shape within, you're looking at the magnitude of the behavior. Maybe it's slower, faster, or harder, softer, or louder, or quieter. Some sort of magnitude of behavior. And what about function? Well, we're not shaping to change the function of your behavior. With shaping, we're looking at approximations and aspects of the behavior. Since we have the topography we want, we now need to change that magnitude. So when we shape within topography, we're looking at necess or we're looking at typically the magnitude. Analyze the following data path. How would you describe the data? Pretty straightforward data analysis question. And what do we use to analyze data? In ABA, we use visual analysis. The reason we like charts and graphs so much is they're very easy to visually analyze, and they're easy to explain to stakeholders. You can quickly look at this graph here and get a good idea without knowing anything about the target behavior, what is occurring in this scenario. So let's look at our path. Let's say we start right above this average line, which would be maybe our level. And we go up one and then well below the average. And then we go back up, all the way back down, back up, back down. Is there any real trend? So let's start there. When you're, when you're analyzing data, first ask yourself, is there a trend? Here, not really. We're increasing, we're decreasing. We're increasing, we're decreasing. We're increasing and we're decreasing. There's no true trend for this data. Then ask yourself, well, what is the variability like? Is the data very variable? And when we look at variability, you're, you're looking at what is the, the separation from the data points into that average. And here we have quite a bit of separation from our top data point to our bottom. And it happens quite frequently. The data is all over the place. This data is extremely variable. And so we have no trend and we have high variability. If we look at our answer choices, A says low variability, increasing trend, steady state responding present. Now we know it's not low variable variability. We know the trend is it increasing and we're not in a steady state because a steady state implies there is essentially no variability. We're trying to achieve steady states and baselines. We don't have a steady state here. So what about B? High variability, yes. Decreasing trend, we don't have a trend. What about C? High variability, yes. No trend, yes. 
no steady state responding present? Yes. And so you can see by doing all our work up front, we can then quickly jump to the answer choices and easily answer the question because we've already predicted the answer. We already know what's going on in the question. So there's high variability, there's no trend, and there's no steady state responding. We always read all of our answer choices. So D, high variability, no trend, steady state responding. We're not in a steady state. That's the difference between C and D. So after analyzing the data path, we would describe the data as high variability, no trend, and then no steady state responding present. A data sheet is distributed to a team of technicians. The data sheet has antecedents, behaviors, and consequences listed out with check boxes next to each. The team is told to check a box under each category every 15 seconds for 10 minutes while observing a client's behavior. What type of assessment is likely occurring? So assessment question. And when we think of assessments, think of preference, indirect, direct, and functional analyses. And then under those direct, think of descriptive assessments. And those are typically the four assessments we, I would recommend we start with. In this case, what are we doing? What do we know already? Well, you, you distribute a data sheet to technicians. And this data sheet has antecedents, behaviors, and consequences already listed out with check boxes next to each. Meaning we've coded the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences in the data sheet in order to take data. All you have to do is check what antecedent happened, what behavior happened, and what consequence happened. Additionally, the team is told to check a box under each category every 15 seconds for 10 minutes while observing a client's behavior. So we immediately know, one, to direct assessment. Two, it's not a functional analysis because we're not manipulating anything. And so, and it's not a preference assessment because we're not doing any sort of stimulus preference test. And so what we're doing here is a direct assessment. Now, what kind of direct assessment? Well, it's going to be some sort of descriptive assessment because we're looking at antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. We're observing the client's behavior and we're not manipulating anything. And so what descriptive assessment involves coded antecedents, behaviors, and consequences continuously, keyword, for a set period of time? Well, that's going to be ABC continuous recording. What's the difference between ABC continuous recording and ABC narrative recording? With ABC narrative recording, you only record data when the behavior occurs. With continuous recording, every 15 seconds, you're going to check off an antecedent and a consequence, even if the behavior hasn't occurred. Additionally, ABC narrative recording is open-ended. We don't have pre-coded antecedents, consequences, and behaviors. That, those are the two primary differences. It isn't scatterplot recording. What does scatterplot recording do? Scatterplot recording records data at certain times. So for example, if we break out in a three-hour session into one-hour blocks, let's say 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., we're going to take data on if the behavior occurred during 8 p.m., during 9, and during 10. And of course, if you extend that out to, let's say, a full school day, you can get a good pattern of when behaviors occur and at what time. Of course, we're not doing that here. And then a functional analysis is when we're manipulating antecedents and consequences in order to determine a function. We're not manipulating the antecedents and consequences here. We're simply observing. So therefore, it's not D. The type of assessment that's likely occurring is ABC continuous recording. How do we know? Well, we have pre-coded antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, and we're continuously observing that behavior for the full 10 minutes. Harry and Sally like to spend their Saturday nights eating at a new fancy restaurant each weekend. Sometimes they go for American food, sometimes Italian, and then other times they will eat at a steakhouse. Going to the different restaurants most represents a what? Let's think about this. They're going to all these different restaurants, and what is that demonstrating? What is that representing? What do we know? We know they like to go out to eat at these fancy restaurants, sometimes American, sometimes Italian, other times steakhouses. So going to all these different restaurants, which would be our stimuli, all serves the same function. They go eat, they're going out, they're having fun. They're, they're, they're all the responses are serving the same function. 
And so when you have a set of responses that are meeting the same need or serving the same function, what do we call that? Hey, a stimulus class. Going to the different restaurants, that is not the stimuli. Going to the different restaurants are our responses. But we're not looking at the stimulus class here. A stimulus class might be the American restaurant, the Italian restaurant, and the steakhouse. They have things in common. They evoke the same responses. But we're not looking at the restaurants. We're looking at going to the restaurants, which is our response. And so going to the different restaurants represents a response class. Now, be careful with response. Remember, response is a single instance of a behavior. We've got multiple instances of behaviors occurring here across different stimuli. It's not a single response. What we have going on is a response class. Same with the stimulus. A stimulus is one single change in the environment or one single item or one single stimulus. We have multiple restaurants here. We're not looking at the one stimulus. We're not even concerned with the stimuli, really, because we're looking at the responses. So going to the different restaurants most represents a response class. Now, we spent more time on that question than necessary because I think this is a very straightforward question. But we're practicing. We're learning. Your goal when you practice is not to go quickly. It's to get every question right. When you miss a question, you don't move on until you've reviewed that question thoroughly. So the more time you spend in practice, the easier it's going to get when you do the real thing. There are several fireworks shows around Las Vegas a few nights ago. I woke up at 10.15 p.m., 10.45 p.m., 11.55 p.m., and 5 a.m. If you were taking into response time data, how many data points would you record for my waking up behavior? Measurement question, looking at into response time. And we need to determine the number of data points for waking up. So what we really need to determine is when do we start taking data for into response time? Is it before the first response, after the first response, or before the second response? When the response time data begins when the first response ends, because into response time is time in between responses, the time between the end of one response and the start of another. So right after 1015 is when data would start. 1015 to 1045 would be our first into response time. 1045 to 1155 would be second. 11.55, 5 would be third. We're going to take three instances of into response time. One would represent latency, because latency is time in between the SD, which would be, let's say, the fireworks going off and me waking up. So this, the fireworks to the 10.15, would be our latency, and then all of these will be our into response times. So if we're taking into response time data, we're going to take three data points for waking up behavior. By definition, stimulus control occurs when the blank of a response is altered in the presence of an antecedent. Straightforward definition question. It's a good teaching question because when we talk about stimulus control, especially in practice, what we really talk, what we typically mean is the therapist or the teacher or the parent or Somebody has control over the behavior. But stimulus control is extended to all stimuli in the environment. If behavior changes more frequently in the presence of stimulus, that stimulus is said to have stimulus control. More specifically, when is stimulus control occurring? Is it when latency is altered, when both duration or latency, or when duration or latency or magnitude? Well, by definition, stimulus occur control occurs when the duration or latency or magnitude of a response is altered in the presence of an antecedent. Now, why is that important? Because you want to be precise on your exam. In practice, when we talk about things like stimulus control, a lot of times we get more abstract because we need to make it make sense to stakeholders and technicians and that sort of thing. Stimulus control, though, is one of those things where for your exam... You want to get very precise. And so, yes, this is more or less a definition question, but it's an important question for your exam to keep you focused and keep you specific. By definition, stimulus control occurs when the duration or latency or magnitude of a response is altered in the presence 
of an antecedent. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Please like and subscribe. As always, work hard, study hard, spread the word, and we'll see you soon.